effort has been around the role of the state, be it where philanthropy, philanthropic organizations were saying they're not there to replace the role of the states, private sector and the policies that they're supposed to implement to make sure that the private sector is able to operate, the other policies and regulatory frameworks to make sure that farmers are able to do their work and access markets and be able to become businesses and not just stay at the household level but really contribute to an economic development of their country. We've also talked about instead of fighting poverty, how do we make sure that we are producing wealth? One key theme in all of this, as I said, has been the state capability. The state capability to put in place policies, the state capability to influence those, to, to implement those policies, but also the political will that goes behind these state capabilities. This afternoon's session is really going to look at just that. It's going to look at state capabilities and we have an amazing lineup of speakers, an amazing lineup of panelists that will do what a lot of the people in uh, some of the panels that we've had have said. How do we move forward? What are the concrete examples to actually go th not only to having the adequate policies that take into account everybody, from the farmer to the business person to um, the, the state itself, but also to push at real implementation. To start us off having this discussion, to be able to frame the discussion and frame the debate, we are very privileged today to have Right Honorable Tony Blair, who not only um, is a statesman, not only is a great leader, but has also touched on all of those aspects in terms of business, in terms of thinking, in terms of thought leadership around the world, and that is here today to give us an amazing keynote address to help us really think about when you are in the position of highest leadership that we can imagine, what is your role and how do you increase not only your capacity, but the entire state capability to drive development and to drive change, not only in your country, in your region, and across the world. So please help me welcome Right Honorable Tony Blair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, Valerie, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually amazing how nice people are to you when you stop being Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say what an honor and pleasure it is to be at this amazing Agra Forum um, in this wonderful city of Kigali. And as someone who's worked in Rwanda now for over a decade with, with my team here through my institute, I just want to say to all the people of Rwanda, you can be so proud of what you've achieved. And to Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, you've shown what a real leader can do in helping to transform his country. And to Agnes, Calabado, the president of Agra. Agnes, well done on everything you've, you've achieved here. It's, a, it's an amazing conference that you've put on. It's getting bigger, I know, every year. Um, I hope it doesn't get smaller after I've addressed it, but you're doing a wonderful job and well done to you. So I want to begin actually back in, in 2005 when, when I was in office and we had the G7 summit and we put Africa on the agenda of the G7 for the first time. And under my government, we set up the Department of International Development. We trebled the budget. Um, Britain now spends. I'm delighted to say this is a matter of commonality between my government and succeeding governments. We've hit the 0.7 target, and we'll continue to do so. But at the time, people thought that was a somewhat quixotic gest gesture. Ten years on, just recently, I was in the United States of America, where I'm pleased to say there is a renewed focus on Africa today. A few days ago, I was with Chancellor Merkel in Germany. And she's just had a visit, a very successful visit to Africa, making it a key priority for Germany, as indeed they did last year at the G20 summit. In Italy, where we discussed both the problems and the opportunities for European investment in Africa, Prime Minister Modi's been here, Turkey has made Africa now a big priority. China, of course, as we all know. And even the Gulf states and the state of Israel. 
So Africa's rising. And the world is taking notice. There's a new group of leaders. There's new ways of working. And there's progress. My institute works in some 14 different African nations today. And every time I come to Africa, I can see the progress that is being made. From the changing cityscapes to evolving economies, these last 10 years have been hugely encouraging. And in agriculture, a similar, similar transformation is beginning. But the fact is it needs to turn into a revolution. Because agriculture is the sector that is key to Africa's future. The continent is most of the world's arable land, and by far the most that's underutilized. Agriculture is the largest contributor to the economy, and of course, to employment. But Africa is still producing too little food and too few value-added products. Too many people still struggle to put food on the table, and many more don't receive the nutrients they need. Agricultural productivity has grown, but far too slowly since the 1970s. The average yield for cereals in Africa is still only 1.5 tons per hectare, whereas in Asia, it's four tons. Too little of the produce is processed on the continent. West Africa produces 70% of the world's cocoa, but a negligible amount of the world's chocolate. Same with cashew nuts. Same across a whole swathe of agricultural products. So despite recent efforts to increase investment, it's still too low. And the continent will not realize the vast potential of agriculture unless this changes. Now, I know these facts aren't lost on anyone today. But as with most development issues, it's not a question of what needs to be done. The big challenge is how. Africa is not short of visionary leaders today, many of whom are putting in place the reforms necessary to unlock Africa's potential. Many countries are pursuing extensive land reform, introducing new technologies, creating new infrastructure, such as energy and roads, so that machinery can function and markets can be accessible to farmers producing. And in West Africa, the very problem I spoke about, about processing, is beginning to be put right. But this challenge is still immense, and it's only going to get larger, because the continent's population is projected to double in the coming decades. Indeed, some projections even see it rising to 4 billion in 50 years' time, from 1.2 billion today. More people will need food and will need better food to improve their health and nutrition. And today, there are well over 200 million undernourished people in sub-Saharan Africa, and this is rising still. So it's crucial that Africa's agricultural transformation shifts gear, and this is the purpose of this forum. To do this, Leaders need more support to drive their agendas, and state capacity is indeed the key. I commend President Kagame, AGRA, and the Africa Union for making this the theme of this year's forum and of the Africa Agricultural Status Report. The report launched by the Prime Minister of Rwanda in this auditorium earlier this week serves as a handbook for governments and their supporting partners to transform agriculture and economic transformation more broadly in Africa. And I also want to applaud Africa's heads of state for adopting the Malibu Declaration of 2014 and for setting up a basis for evidence-based planning and implementation led by the Africa Union Commission and NEPAD with the Biennial Review. So this focus on capacity is definitely right. And here's what I learned in 10 years in government as prime minister. I never actually held any other position in government, which 
If you're going to start, you might as well start at the top, I guess. But <laughs> Although sometimes I wish I had, because I, over time and in the new work that I've done since leaving office, I've come to have a, a greater sense of sympathy for the ordinary minister than probably I did when I was prime minister. So what I learned is this. Number one, having the grand vision is the easy part. Okay. The, the challenge is turning the vision into reality. You know, there was a famous American politician who said once that you, you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. This is very true. When you actually get into government, you have your first usually rather a weakening clash with reality. And governments usually have systems, bureaucracies, institutions that can be brilliant at managing the status quo, but not so good at changing it. So when you're looking at transformation and revolution, and you take an area like agriculture, and you don't just want to be business as usual, you want it to be quite different, then you have to focus on capacity and delivery in a wholly revolutionary way also. And I'd like to focus on what I ended up calling the four Ps of the science and art of delivery in government. And I think anybody who's in government today, whether you're a minister or you're a civil servant and top official or you're working for an agency that's connected with government, you'll recognize these challenges. And I developed them myself in government when I came to a very stark realization after some time in power. When I first became Prime Minister, I had this sense that, you know, as Prime Minister of Britain, I was presumably quite powerful. And I had this, what turned out to be an illusion, that if I was sitting around the cabinet table in the big chair, right, the big guy, and I took a decision, something would happen. Big mistake. By and large, you took the decision, nothing happened. So I started to realize that just taking the decision was the first step. Making sure that decision then were actually turned into something, not in a government department in a paper, but for a family, for a village, for a community, for a town and a city on the ground, that was a whole other different business. And basically, after my first term, I then set up a different set of structures in government precisely because I was struggling with the gap between vision and reality. And those four Ps are these. First, prioritization. If you try to do everything, you'll end up doing nothing. You know, when I read these papers that are often written by international institutions or consultants for governments, and they say, you know, Vision 2030, or in our days you see Vision 2050, and you read them and you think, that would be brilliant. But that's in an ideal world. But in the real world, if you're taking something as critical and as important as agriculture, but where you're relying on a whole set of different dimensions to a problem that has to be solved, and you're having to interact with different groups of people and interests, and you're actually wanting to make a difference to people's lives on the ground, you're not going to be able to do everything to do with agriculture, but you may be able to take three or four really critical things and get them done. So my advice is start with prioritization. What are the things that are really going to make the difference? What are the things that 
in three, four years' time, and you always find, by the way, in government, the time passes faster than you can ever believe. You know, what are the things that you really want to be judged by? What are the things that have the agency of transformation in them and not simply the agency of incremental improvement? So prioritization is the first thing. The second thing is policy. And here's the great thing about today's world, and it's one of the reasons why Agra is such an important institution. You know, one of the things I often hear in the different countries I work around the world is people say, oh, no, my country's different. And I always say to people, of course, every country is different. The context is different. But actually, the problems are often the same. And by the way, the problems of implementation in government are true whether you're working in the United States, the UK, or the poorest countries on this continent. But somewhere, someone, somehow, will be grappling with the problem that you have. So somebody is sitting there thinking, how do I innovate in the agricultural space? How do I create a better yield? How do I make sure that I get the right combination of help? How do I extend credit and finance to smallholders? How do we make sure we build up export markets? How do we make sure we do import institutions? Someone somewhere will have that problem and they'll be succeeding. And one of the great things about the world today is it's an open marketplace in ideas. So when it comes to policy, study it carefully. And by the way, if I can make a, maybe a somewhat indiscreet piece of advice, never mind what you wrote in the manifesto. Believe me, when you get into government, it's a whole other, <laughs> it's a whole other world of knowledge. But make sure that before you start implementing, you've not just established your priorities, but you've got the policies based on the empirical evidence of which there will be a mountain worldwide of what actually works and what doesn't. And the third P is personnel. So here's about the most obvious thing in the world to say about any walk of life. But it's amazing how, in government, people find this quite groundbreaking. You are only ever going to be as good as the team around you. That's true if you're running a, if you're coaching a football club, a football team, or running a business, or running a community center, or running a country. So the personnel matter, and they matter because some of this stuff is complicated. And you need people who have the expertise. And if you need, by the way, to go and get the expertise from elsewhere, get it from elsewhere. It's, it's a great thing to have pride in your country and in its people. But it's a foolish thing not to go and access the best knowledge available if, it, if the reality is it's not available in your own nation and country. I always give to people the example of Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, who when Singapore was thrown out of Malaysia in the 1960s and they didn't have much and they were trying to build their country. Many people said because they were, had a sense, who were they gonna be as a country? How were they gonna manage? And many people said to him, you've gotta make sure that we just limit it to people who live here. And he said, no, we're gonna go out and get the best brains wherever they are and we're gonna bring them in. So they imported intellectual capital, but today they export intellectual capital. I know from my team working here in Rwanda, what a fantastic group of people have grown up in this country in the past few years. So make sure that the personnel are right. And when your systems are causing difficulty, as many systems do, and there are vested interests standing in the way, you have to be prepared sometimes to bypass that system in order to get the job done properly. It's a difficult thing to say, but I promise you it's the only way to do it. And what I learned in government was that four or five really good people in a department can make all the difference. But make sure that you get them. And the final thing, the final P, so prioritization, policy, personnel, final P is performance management. In other words, what the French would call le suivi, 
making sure the thing actually gets done. Making sure that the information that the system's telling you is true is actually true. Going and getting the information yourself if necessary. One of the things I learned in government was every month my team used to make me go out and spend a day out in a different part of the country. And I often used to complain because there'd be some crisis going on in government, some scandal, there'd be some problem. And I think, no, I've got to be back in, 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 in London, in, in Whitehall, in Downing Street dealing with the problem. But every time I went out onto the front line, every single time I learned something. Because if you can have an honest conversation with people who are really out there on the ground, they'll tell you what's wrong. They'll say to you, look, I know you think you've got this policy, and I know you think it's working in this way, but actually it isn't, and here are the problems. And every time I went out and talked to people, I learned something. But then I would bring that back and have a system to performance manage. In other words, the priority and the policy and the implementation all went together. So following it through, making sure that those critical things that you've said you're going to do, you actually do, absolutely central to the question of how you use your capacity effectively and how you deliver. And the final thing I'd say is this. Nothing will work without leadership from the top and without the government as a government acting as a whole. You see, an agricultural problem is not just an agriculture problem. It's an infrastructure problem. It's an education problem. It's a business investment problem. So there's going to be no solution to the agriculture challenge that doesn't involve every aspect of government and every department in government under the leadership of the top person and driven by that top person saying this is a priority for us. I mean, you know what it's like being a minister? You're in your own little silo. You know, you've got a thousand and one little issues you've got to deal with, and every so often you sit around the cabinet table and hope the finger doesn't come around and point at you. This is, this is politics and life, but when you've got these priorities clear, they're only ever going to happen if the top person gets behind it and if the government as a whole shares the same vision and is helping you, supporting you, delivering the change. So I think this applies, to agri this applies to any part of government, but I think it applies to agriculture particularly. The challenges are so big and the transformation so necessary that you can't afford not to build that institutional capacity and capability of driving the change through. And unless that comes through every single bit of the governing system, it will never work. Let me conclude on, on this point. I mean, I learned, I learned the government in the end is, you know, it is obviously all about implementation, but it's, it's, a, it's a job in one sense like any other job. In other words, the more passionate you are about it, the more likely you are to achieve change. The more you study it, the more likely the change is to be effective. And the more experience you have, over time, the better you should be. Indeed, I used to say to people, sometimes I think the journey of politics is that you start at your most popular and least capable, and then you end at your least popular and most capable. But the reason this forum is happening today, and the reason we can be optimistic, is that Africa is getting on its feet. I mean, to be absolutely frank, when I was prime minister, I don't think we could even have thought that we would be having a forum like this and a discussion like this. The important thing that you're coming together is this is what it's really about. Ultimately, politics isn't about big speeches and big visions you know, enthusing the crowd, easy rounds of applause. I mean, all of that is the bit of politics that in the end I came to be able to do, but have much less respect for. The bit of politics that really matters
is the bit of politics that's down in the weeds, in the detail, that's actually getting the job done for the people. That's the thing that really matters. And if I would leave you with anything, it's this. You can be optimistic about Africa today because you're here discussing this topic in this way. But never forget in the end that whatever people may think the business of politics about, it's actually about the people, the ordinary people, the people that you know are living much poorer lives than you, the people that you know that have enormous potential, but if things don't change, they will never see that potential fulfilled. So when we deb debate all the detail and into, into the policy weeds, just remember that if you get these things right, lives are changed, people have hope. This continent starts to be what it can and should be. So it's not just a discussion about policy. It's not just an arcane exercise in exchanging information. It's actually a mission, and it's a worthwhile mission. And I know we've got a long way to go, but we are at last on our way. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, Right Honorable. We're past the poetry, let's get to the prose. This is the moment that this panel gets to the delivery. And for that, we have an amazing panel to continue this conversation around the four Ps that are necessary. Prioritize, policy, the right personnel, and performance management. And for that, I'd like to take this opportunity to call the rest of the panel to join the Right Honorable Tony Blair, uh, Jendazi Fraser, are you? Could you come on? Thank you. Please welcome her. She's the managing partner of Africa Exchange Holdings. I'd also like to welcome Mr. Leo Nelsonsou, the managing partner and co-founder of Southridge and former minister of Benin, prime minister of Benin. Thank you. Mr. Gilbert Ongbo, the president of IFAD. Dr. Schengen Fan, the Director General of IFPRI. And finally, Mr. Roger Voorhees, the Executive Director of Global Growth and Opportunity for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And to moderate this highly exceptional panel that is so artful at writing prose, I'd like to welcome the moderator for this panel, who will be Mr. Halid Bomba the CEO of the Ethiopian Agriculture Transformation Agency to take us through the next discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been told that we have until uh, four o'clock for this. So just in terms of time management, we have about 15 minutes. So we'll try to go through one set of uh, questions and hopefully we'll have uh, an opportunity for uh, opening up the, uh, uh, the dialogue to the audience. Maybe just following up on uh, Mr. Blair's comments, I I'd like to first ask uh, um, Lionel, just from your position as a, a former prime minister, um, you heard Mr. Blair talk about how agriculture is important across all different sectors, be it education, be it transport. Um, and I wonder, how do we get our heads of state to take true ownership because across the continent, we hear heads of state saying agriculture is important. But when it comes to performance management, when it comes to delivery, there's really a lack of follow through from time to time in some countries because you hear the dialogue of agriculture's importance, but when it comes to the day-to-day follow-up, it always doesn't happen. So I wonder from your experience as a former head of state, what would you advise us to do in terms of pushing and pressuring our heads of state to take true ownership of the agriculture sector? First, I would like to, to, to say that uh, I have not been a prime minister for 10 years, 
uh, but for 10 months. So you, you see <laughs> that I remained in the gray zone where you are, not very experienced, not very skilled, coming from the private sector, which aggravates my case, because I was running a private equity firm in Europe. And for me to mobilize in terms of resources, a billion dollar was a sort of monthly experience. And I realized that it took five to 10 years to deliver after everything had been agreed just to absorb, to receive and absorb those resources. Especially when um, you consider a sector like agriculture, where you have so many small holders, then where each transaction, in terms of cost of transaction, cost of any project, is a, is a huge cost. The cost of transaction, the cost of information, the cost of data in agriculture is even far higher than in service industries or manufacturing industries. The first question I asked to the central banker in Cotonou when I arrived was the allocation of uh, financial domestic resources to various sectors. He told me agriculture receives 2% of the credit uh, by the banking system, and less so in the microfinance sector. It is 23% of our GDP and 50% of our employment, of our active population employment. 50, 23, 2. So one of the questions was to make people aware that in terms of regulations, in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of constructing uh, a budget, in terms of regulating the, f the, the financial system, we had a major financial revolution to associate to a green revolution. You cannot use, you cannot mobilize your potential if you have absolutely, in, in the agriculture sphere, if you are absolutely underfinanced, we are dramatically underfinanced. You know, for any government, you have so many um, uh, advice on how to limit your indebtedness. But the reason why we have to uh, create debt for the, the government is that the private sector in Africa is not financed. And the least finance of all the private sectors is agriculture, because it's so decentralized, it's a sort of minuscule, uh, f little f f smallholders. Okay? So to make a government aware of that um, is really a priority. It's very difficult, very difficult to, to, to achieve because of the costs associated to that. We have no credit agricole, we have no rural an agricultural credit institution of any kind in a country like mine, but in the majority of sub-Saharan uh, countries. We are dramatically under financing that. And the problem is that agriculture is the most capital intensive industry after energy. Nobody will believe that. It is the most capital intensive. Because if you compare with the revenue, the revenue for produce is quite low. We, we, you speak of uh, commodities, but it is the most capital intensive. And it is the number one user of energy and water supply, which are the other two most intensive, most capital intensive industries. Nobody will intuitively accept that. So you see, you have first an advocacy work within a government. And being an advocate within the government, um, you, you need a few years of, of experience because you have really to change completely the vision, the understanding. It is counterintuitive. It is counterfactual. But we are not financing our agriculture. So it's a miracle that we are able to feed the continent as we are doing today.
And if we have not a financial revolution, we will not have the full green revolution, I think. Thank you. And, and thankfully, we, we have IFAD here to maybe talk to us a little bit about financial uh, capacity within the state uh, and more broadly. Uh, maybe, Gilbert, you can tell us a little bit about some of the things that IFAD is doing and working with African governments to increase the amount of investment to the agricultural sector and broadly building financial capacity. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, from an uh, IFAD perspective, uh, it's true that uh, we focus on providing the um, financial resources to, to the, at, the rural, uh, at the rural level. And all our programs are implemented by the government. We don't implement that ourselves, which is part of our um, determination to contribute to the government uh, ownership and capacity building. So it's very clear that if you don't, you can see the direct impact of the capacity at the, uh, at the government level, at the political level, the impact of that um, political will on the success of the project. So I believe it's very, very, very crucial. Obviously, one thing is the, uh, we cannot say it enough that bringing the finance to the rural level is uh, one of the major challenges we have in uh, Ag today. Um, however, just as uh, um, Prime Minister um, Zinsu just said, once you mobilize the resources, this is one thing. Have it deliver on the ground is the other, is the other uh, a challenge that we, uh, we, we see there. So, but, you, you know, our government are what they are, and I'm always uh, relieved to hear Prime Minister Tony Blair talking about the challenge that he has. Sometimes we believe that we only have those challenges in our own continent, Africa. So it's also interesting to hear that the challenges are from the civil servant everywhere, international or domestic. So you, need, you really need to be focused as the first P that uh, Anthony Blair mentioned, on what are the priorities. Obviously today we talk about the agriculture being on the top of the priority, on a priority. You finish that forum and you bring the health minister. They're also going to tell the prime minister that health has to be on the top of priority, and so on and so on. So this is why uh, one of what we are advocating in IFAD Everything has to start with the national planning, the national setup of the priorities. This is the first step, the first level where we believe that agriculture needs to find its place. Um, then later on, when it comes to the, um, the arbitrage in terms of uh, um, uh, the means of finance, budget allocation, you m can make sure that it is there. The other point uh, which we, we, we learned is the ability to our government um, to put money where the mouth is. One thing is to say that, yes, I want it. One thing is to say that it is on my priorities. But if the government does not put its own resources where it is, it's going to be challenging. So that's why we ins insist a lot in uh, IFAD in, the, in our loan, which are essentially highly concessional or grant, uh, we insist on having the domestic resources to the same activity. And that is going to be important for the impact of the project and the sustainability of government continuing after the project closes. So that uh, perspective, I believe, is also key. Uh, then the, 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 the fourth point that I want to put in terms of looking at the finance and the government, uh, uh, the, the, the government will, is, um, we, it's important for us to keep in mind that, yes, the development partners on one hand, the government on the other hand, but that is not sufficient. We really need to make sure that how do we bring um, the people, the citizens, and in our case, the rural communities, they have to be at the center, <clears throat> uh, at the center of the planning. Um, very often, um, countries in Africa where two-thirds of the population are rural, where sometimes up to 30, 35, 40 percent of the GDP based on agriculture, we will have a lot of seminar, prepared national development plan without even bringing those that are working in the sector. 
that for me is the other challenge that we really need to look in terms of this uh, capacity uh, um, uh, building and the effectiveness of what we, uh, we, uh, we want to do. So I'll stop here for the moment. Thank you. Maybe, Jenda, I can ask you, in, in the work that you do, and I think we've heard Mr. Blair talk about implementation capacity, seeing through a vision all the way to delivery. And um, uh, Joubert had just spoken about planning being an important aspect of that and working with local communities to ensure that there is that type of ownership. In the work that you do, the, the type of skill sets and capacity that you think is really critical to deliver by government, what do you think those are? for governments to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would say that um, good information and data is absolutely essential. Um, knowing, um, having a good market analysis, um, actually having the type of uh, data that you can use to project uh, forward. I think that uh, data is absolutely critical. I think that too often um, decisions are made um, without fundamental knowledge. Um, and that's where, you know, issues of big data and uh, the sort of data revolution and artificial intelligence, et cetera, come into play, you know, good statistical de uh, departments come into play on the capacity of governments to make solid decisions. Um, so I think that's uh, first and foremost, or I won't say first and foremost, but absolutely a critical uh, component. I think the second thing is we, we don't talk enough about politics. Uh, and I do think that um, politics matter. Leadership is absolutely critical, uh, but politics matter quite a lot. And not only national politics, but regional and global politics. Um, because I think that governments can have priorities, leaders can have vision, um, but the capacity to execute on that um, has to do with election cycles. Uh, it has to do with uh, financing, you know, campaign financing, um, so vested interests uh, come into play to constrain uh, the capacity of that leadership and that vision to be executed and uh, global, global issues. For instance, this new um, report that's come out on African agriculture monitoring, it talks about what are some of the barriers and constraints to Africa's competitiveness globally um, in agriculture, and they talk about Western subsidies Right? Western subsidies for their farmers, which is politics um, in, in um, the Western countries, undermining the pricing and competitiveness of African farmers um, here. So I think that that absolutely, we have, to, we have to deal with politics and be realistic about it and build it into uh, the processes of execution. And then I think uh, probably I would go to the private sector. Um, and I think that there's a disconnect sometimes between government and the private sector. There's a lot of emphasis on PPPs. And some of us in the private sector call those perpetually postponed projects, right? <laughs> because the time frame for private sector and the time frame for government is very different. Private sector has to deliver and deliver fast. Um, government often, especially in the creation of policies and in the politics that are being carried out, um, you're looking at a very extended time period. I'll, I'll give an example, a concrete example. I'm working on uh, commodity exchanges, and so we have the East Africa Commodity Exchange that's based here in Rwanda, but it's intended to be regional, and we have the Africa Apex, the Africa Ex Commodity Exchange in Nigeria. And in East Africa, when we, when we started the vision for the commodity exchange, private sector-led commodity exchange, we worked very closely with the East Africa community because we understood that for agriculture to be competitive, we needed it to be regional because the markets are too, si too small nationally um, to get the type of liquidity and to get the tri type of trade competitiveness um, that's necessary to, to, to be prosperous globally. And so we worked very closely with the East Africa community, a very receptive environment that we had. We signed MOUs with the East Africa community. We then carried that forward to each of the national governments. The presidents of each of the national governments had leadership and vision on agriculture and the importance of agriculture, as well as the importance of regional trade and trade integration. So we had no problems at the head of state level. And this, I think, gets to uh, Mr. Blair's point about implementation and uh, management. We came here to Rwanda, to Kigali in 2014 as part of the 
um, East Africa Northern Regional Corridor integration. So it was a fast track and agriculture was prioritized and commodity exchanges were also prioritized. And the heads of state s signed an agreement saying that they wanted, this is now 2014, so four years ago, signed an agreement saying that they supported a regional commodity exchange and that would be East, East Africa Exchange. The day after, their ministers ran home and started a process for developing national exchanges. The very day, literally um, the day after. And so, you know, that isn't, that's a certain degree of nationalism that comes into play in pride. Um, that's a certain degree of vested interests that come into play. Um, now, now, the commodity exchange to be successful could not wait on government. We had to actually go into the market, work with the smallholder farmers, work with the banks, and those willing governments and those willing ministers work with them. In the case of Rwanda, we had an absolutely receptive environment and a government that has been nothing but supportive. Um, I will say in some of the neighboring countries, not so much, um, but we are work the farmers want it. Even some of the large traders and small traders who would, one would think would be natural competitors also see the value of structured trade. They also see the value of quality and quantity assurances. They see the value in terms of food security. They see the value in terms of food safety. Um, so I think that as the private sector, the private sector has to remain in a driving role. Um, it, 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 it's, it's driven by a bottom line that doesn't allow for the delays of politics, um, the delays of you know, um, certain vested interests that governments naturally, there's, it's not just African governments. This is true of government all over the place. I used to be at State Department, and when I left government, I have to say I would drive by State Department, I would think those poor people, they're working so hard in that building to get so little done. <laughs> because government is a contact sport. You know, it's um, ideologically driven. People have different views of what the priority should be. As was said before, it should be health, it should be education, it should be agriculture. Those are all legitimate um, concerns. And especially if you don't have that hard leadership that is, requires accountability among its ministers um, and its senior officials, you're, you're, not, you're, not gonna, you're, you're not gonna be able to deliver from just state capacity. You have to partner, um, especially with the private sector, and be responsive um, to the, uh, you know, the, the, the constituencies within the sectors that you're working for. Thank you. Uh, I'll come back to the private sector um, with the question to, to Roger. But before that, um, maybe Schengen, speaking of data and evidence, and, and we all, I think, have come to the conclusion that science, data, evidence-based decision-making is the right way to go. However, the collection of data is just the beginning of the process because there needs to be that an analytical capacity within government to know what to do with th that data. How do you interpret it? What does that mean? And then how do you actually, as you said before, since it's all driven by politics at the end of the day, how do you advocate for your case in point? And I wonder, uh, from IFPRI's point of view, how you're working with African governments to build their capability, not only to collect the data, but to analyze and advocate for what the data is actually telling us? Well, firstly, I have been very impressed by the strong commitment of African leaders in using agriculture to deliver broad, broader development outcome and hunger, malnutrition, to protect our natural resource, resources and so on. But the commitment also comes from everybody in the room, almost every citizen here in Africa. So I see a great movement right now so African is ready to use agriculture to do something very different. Now, how data, information, evidence can play a role in this? I was impressed this January when the former prime minister of Ethiopia and also the, the president of Rwanda were in Davos having breakfast with Bill Gates and I was there just to provide some thoughts. The first time I think probably the first time I have seen a beautiful scorecard called African Agriculture Transformation Scorecard. I don't know whether you, you have seen a copy. It's truly impressive. 
when the president of Rwanda looked at that chart, he looked at the, all the different colors for Rwanda, obviously he felt very happy about the agriculture performance. But in the meantime, he began to be very worried about the performance of child stunting on a couple of other indicators. He said, okay, now I'm going to come back to talk to my, my minister of health to understand why the child stunting remain very high, despite great performance of agriculture. So you see how that sort of scorecards will play a huge role. So IPRI has been working with African Union, African partners, to support this so-called CADA, Comprehensive Agriculture Development Program. Starting in 2005, CADA was launched in 2003. So we track the data, we monitor the progress, particularly in terms of agricultural spending, as well as agriculture growth. I must say that, yes, we made a lot of progress in many countries, including Rwanda, including Ethiopia, and many other countries. But unfortunately, many countries are still very far away from that 10%. <coughs> Agriculture growth, the target was 6%. I think today, again, there's still a big gap. So you can see just the simple data, reliable data, well, obviously timing data, will be very critical to create that sort of accountability. Another big point I wanted to make here is African leaders wanted to be accountable. The African Union, I think last December or this Jan or maybe uh, this January, they committed themselves to use this so-called biannual mechanism to peer review their performance in agriculture, in food security, nutrition, uh, many indicators identified by their multiple declaration. So that sort of commitment to use data, to use indicators to make, make themselves accountable is truly impressive. Now, in addition to the regional support, the EPRI provided data, capacity support at the regional level, I think equally important is our work with the country level. We have worked with Ethiopia for probably 15, 20 years. And uh, you know, I think, um, Halid, you mentioned about institutional capacity. In Ethiopia, so instead of individual capacity, they also look at in institutional capacity. They are also not afraid of, let's say, been fail, been failing. So for example, ATA in the Hali you are leading, ATA is a new institution. Commodity exchange, I think the first time in the African continent we begin to test, to pilot commodity exchange. It may fail, but at least we learn from it. And again, the country strategy support program to provide information, data, and build the capacity. EDI, the Ethiopian Development Research Institute, the think tank for the government to make the right decision, to really monitor, to track the progress. So we have been working together with our national partners, shoulder by shoulder, hands by hands. Not only Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, many other countries. Here in Rwanda, I think the prime minister made a spe specific request to IPRI. They wanted to do the same thing. So we had a, some dialogue with the minister, uh, Geraldine, minister of agriculture, to really make sure that you know, we have the capacity here, not just individual, individual capacity. More important is institutional capacity to gather the data, to analyze the issues, and to track, monitor the progress, and to propose you know, these so-called three Ps, you know, policies, uh, net priorities, and look at implementation, look at the performance. And so at IPRI, we're very much committed to work with you to continue to support you at the regional level, country level, and probably even lower at the, some of the sub-state level in large countries like Nigeria. Last point I wanted to make is, IPRI is a global institute, so we have strong experience in many other countries, particularly in Africa, or in Asia. Mutual learning, to share what we have learned, to avoid some of the mistakes, some of the mistakes we made in Asia, huge mistakes so that Africa can truly accelerate the progress to achieve ending hunger and malnutrition by 2030, probably even before that. Thank you. Ro Roger, maybe just uh, tying things up with you, th there seems to be uh, this common theme of institutional capacity, uh, be it for implementation, as, uh, as Mr. Blair initially uh, pointed out in his uh, keynote address, uh, 
or as Jendai was talking about how the capacity and the speed at which the public sector works relative to the private sector's time, there's a huge gap. And, and now as Chengen is talking about, it's not just human capacity, but institutional capacity. And I wonder from the foundation's point of view, there's a lot of investments that the foundation has made in uh, public goods and in uh, the CG centers and in research centers across Africa. How are you thinking about building sustainable institutional capacity in African organizations that can actually deliver for impact? So, you know, most of you know that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is really driven by this idea that all lives have equal value, but not all lives have equal opportunity. And as we think about what drives poverty, and we look over history of the successes that have been, and there have been many in the last 30 years, the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty has fallen in half. We try and understand what it takes to drive that change. And I think oftentimes we get into this debate about we want to have the efficiency and the effectiveness of the private sector, and they're going to solve this problem for us. or look, the private sector doesn't care about low-income people, and therefore we need to have a public sector approach. And at the Gates Foundation, we try and actually break down the question differently and say, why does the market fail to provide for low-income people? Why is there the right seed, the right fertilizer, the right extension for big commercial farms? Why doesn't it happen for smallholders? Or in our financial inclusion work, why does the banking system historically in some countries of Africa only serve 10% of the population? And then we try and back into that really practically and say, what would be the public goods that would have to exist to unlock the market for people to reach their potential and crowd in the private sector? And getting that right is really important. And it's important for a couple of reasons, and I'll give an example from a, an area completely unrelated to agriculture. Let's talk about global positioning system because many of us flew in to be here. And if we think about GPSs, right, they actually are societal goods or public goods that aggregate value for everybody in the market, not just aggregate value for the owner of that technology innovation. And that sponsored all kinds of hardware improvements. So now I have GPS in my phone and in an airplane and on a boat, and now I can use a drone to position a field in agriculture. Plus there are all kinds of applications, uh, whether that's finding out where my kids are or when I lose my wallet to navigating through, uh, um, an in, in navigating into where farms are located. And so what we try to do at the Gates Foundation is to understand what things are naturally public goods that actually provide a place to aggregate value for the society, and what places are private goods that create a competitive, innovative marketplace that drives solutions at a low cost and open, robust way efficiently. And so we as the Gates Foundation try and understand that and then invest in those institutions that actually both aggregate value at the public level and then drive competition at the private level. And I'll give a couple examples. You mentioned the CG system. I think next to USAID, we're the second largest funder of the CG system. That's really driven because if we look across the world, we're under investing in early stage research of what's gonna be necessary to drive the right kinds of crops in the right kinds of economic or agrological zones to the right kinds of plot size in the right kinds of soil. And let's just think about that for a second in the case of uh, Africa. It looks like if with current population rates continue, in the next 30 years, there are going to be two billion more people on the planet. A huge piece of that is going to be on the continent of Africa. That means we're gonna have to raise agricultural productivity 60%. In addition, that means we're gonna have to get continental-wide probably 1.8% of genetic gains every year. And we are a long way from that. And if you add climate change to that, where maize is predicted to fall in its yield somewhere between 20 and 30 or maybe even 40%, how do we invest now for the research that's going to be necessary to drive those innovations that are available for the public and the private sector
to adapt them into the markets that we care about. And so we invest in those public goods because they're a universal good that we think that philanthropy is uniquely designed to do. And some of those are starting to bear fruit from a decade ago. Photosynthetic efficiency, nitrogen fixation so that we don't have to use as much fertilizer. And those things which are beginning to come out still have another decade left, but help create, prepare the world for what's going to be needed in the future. And that's not just scientific public goods we invest in, but we also think about them as delivery public goods. We think about them as policy public goods. Years ago, when we drove financial inclusion, we found it out that ever since 9-11, the requirements around know your customer were so high that you needed a driver's license or a passport, in some cases both. And that left the majority of the low-income world out. So how do we create a new form of understanding identification so that people can participate in a banking system where before they were not allowed to without risking up the whole system. So how do we protect and invest in those public goods where we think drive societal platforms that benefit large swaths of society and at the same time actually create a competitive environment where there's real innovation. Th thank you, Roger. Uh, Mr. Blair, let me just go back to the original uh, kind of hypothesis that you put forward to us, which is the fact that agriculture is not limited to one sector, and it requires the head of state to be the driver, especially here in Africa, where we are at an early stage of development. Now, in our audience, we have ministers, we have private sector, we have civil society organizations, we have youth, we have a cross-section of society. And I wonder if you can give us any advice on how do we put pressure on our leaders to make sure that they go beyond the lip service of telling us that agriculture is important to actually performance managing the sector and making it their priority and reporting to the public on the progress that's being made on a regular basis. What can we do to make sure that that happens? Yes, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, you know, speaking, um, uh, for a moment as, as part of the small club of um, sort of former prime ministers or people who've been prime ministers, whether for 10 years or 10 months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, you know, let me try and put it in a slightly different way. What is it that makes someone like me, if I'm prime minister, say, okay, I'm really gonna make the system go with that? And the answer is, Number one, um, it's got to be a real priority for the leader themselves. And actually for agriculture, by the way, it should be. Because it stands to reason if, if, if it's more than 50% of the employment, let, a, let alone how important it is for the country, I mean, you, if you're making progress in agriculture, you're probably doing something reasonably popular. So, the first thing is the leader's commitment's got to be there for, for, for sure. Um, and that also means that the leader's time is, is going to be focused on it as well. And one of the things that I, I always do with either ministers or, or prime ministers or presidents that I work with now, because I did the same thing for myself shortly, you know, after being in office, actually probably for maybe 80 months or so, and it's a really good thing to do, is what are your priorities on this side of the ledger? How do you spend your time <laughs> on this side of the ledger? It's quite shocking what a disparity it is. By the way, if as a leader you've got even 40% of your time spent on your priorities, you're doing really well, but frankly, you do this exercise with people, and sometimes it's about 3%. And here's the problem with politics. You've got meetings. You got, I always say to people, and I, I say this with the greatest apology to everyone involved here in protocol, a happy protocol is the sign of a bad government. Because they're always at organizing meetings, and you can spend your entire life in meetings. So the prime minister's, the, the, or the president, the leader, has got to have the time also. But here's the third thing which matters for the ministers, civic society, private sector. It's a lot easier if you're a leader to drive something through if you're given a clear proposal that looks like it's based on evidence and has got some reasonable prospect of success. And this is where, you know, leading on what Roger was saying a moment or two ago, 
you know, the great thing about today's world is there is a wealth of evidence out there and of experience and expertise. Use it. You know, and I would, it, it, as I say, if, if you're taking on a ministerial task today, you know, really don't, don't lose yourself in the confines of the way it's been done. You know, break out of that and think, well, how could we be doing things differently? And this is where, by the way, technology isn't, technology is never a substitute for capacity. You've got to have the capacity, but it would be smart nowadays as technology increases the potential for doing things to access it. So I think you also need to be putting in front of the leader a clear set of propositions and say to them, look, here are the following things that we, 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 we can do this if the system delivers it. It's an achievable objective. It's a realistic policy. We're going to track it and implement it, but we need your authority. You know, what is it that the leader has? They have authority most of the time, okay, <laughs> unless they're conspiring to take your place, which they are also most of the time, but, you know, <laughs> that's just politics. But the fact is, the leader's got the authority. And here's the thing, you need the, the ministers, there's literally no priority I could ever think of in government where the, the issue is absolutely locked up in the silo of that department. In other words, it could succeed or fail purely by what that department did. Almost always, and agriculture is a classic, it's other ministries. And the other ministers are sat around the table with the leader. The important thing is that the leadership is saying, look, this is my priority, and you guys are going to have to make your departments also assist in this project. That's really what I meant by what I was saying earlier. And this can be, you know, this can be done, and... You know, one thing I'd, I'd just say, one of the things that I, 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 I do nowadays is, and with the Institute is study countries next door to each other, same population, same resources, same potential, one succeeds, one fails. Why is it? And the answer is very simple. In a world in which you can import virtually anything, the one thing you can't import is the quality of governance. I mean, if the government, I mean, I, I don't want to be undiplomatic, <laughs> but Rwanda, okay, and yeah, so, <laughs> no, but hey, right. Colombia, Venezuela, what is the greatest experiment in, 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 in governance in human history? The Korean Peninsula. Okay, so, you know, <laughs> How, how, how did a third world country become a first world country? Quality of governance. So this is what I think is, 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 is important. And so you, you're absolutely right. You've got to get the leader behind it. But it's a lot easier to do that if what you're putting before them is a proposition they think, you know what, I'm, going to, I'm prepared to use my weight and authority to make it happen. And where, where governments function, this is a great thing about politics. When people tell you politics is all nonsense and so on and so forth, in the end, there's nothing more satisfying as a politician than actually seeing that you've achieved something for the people you represent. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, just in the interest of time, maybe we can open it up to the audience for a few questions, but please, Indeed, questions or comments, but please keep them extremely brief so that we can have an opportunity for our panel just to make uh, some closing observations before, uh, before we finish on time. So any comments, questions that people would like to make? I think we've covered good ground here, that means, huh? Okay, I think we've got a, a question back there. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks, panelists. I think this was a very interesting discussion. I just have one kind of existential question. And some of the panelists said earlier that you can be very proud of what you're doing at the country level, but also be open and look at outside what is happening outside the rest of the world. Looking at country like UK, where, for example, the average farm size is 80 or 90 hectares per farm, um, looking at other countries such as Malaysia or even Morocco where the average farm size is between 3 hectare to even 10 hectare and looking at 
Africa, where it's less than 0.5 hectare. So do you think that smallholder farming, the way it's done in Africa right now, is sustainable? Thank you. Okay. Let's just maybe take one more, and then we'll uh, just over here. Is there a... There we go. Thank you. Nati Barak, I'm with Netafim. We are the drip irrigation people from Israel, and I have a question. We have the technology, but we are the private sector. So when our salesman lands in Addis Abeba, and he has to decide whether to go to the right and meet a sugarcane entrepreneur for a multi-million dollar project, or to go to a remote village to work with smallholders, he will make the obvious decision. But we cannot overlook the, the business potential with 500 million smallholders and in order to reach them, we have the technology, we have the know-how, we know that it builds capacity, but we cannot do it alone. We need partnerships. So how do we approach governments, financing institutions, uh, NGOs in order to help us to do business with smallholder farmers? Great. Th thank you. Maybe let me just ask uh, the panel for your closing observations, maybe addressing the two comments that were made or comments made by the other panelists. And, and let me start maybe with you, Roger, uh, at the end so that Mr. Blair can have the last word. Uh, 30 seconds. So in 30 seconds, I think that the evidence <laughs> worldwide has been almost no country has come out of poverty without inclusive ag transformation being the driver. And we've seen that intensification with the right kinds of market connectedness and the right kinds of technology can make smallholder farmers competitive. But we also need the policies that allow people to move off the farm and consolidate farms as uh, different kinds of economies grow. So I think that I wouldn't be discouraged about plot size um, because I think that we have a long history that that's an overcomable thing. Schengen? Yeah, we have at least three former prime ministers over here. How can we make sure that our leaders are truly accountable? Data, information, evidence. And also communicate the data, evidence to all citizens so they are empowered with that. Then we can make sure that, or whether it's Mr. Tony Blair, or Homeboy used to be a prime minister, right? <laughs> and also a former prime minister. From I think that empower every citizen with <coughs> data, information, evidence. So they will not get away from us. You there? Just maybe quickly answer directly the question raised in terms of the perennial question between the smallholder in Africa and the, maybe the, the commercial um, and farming. I don't think that is either or. And I think the two concepts have to go together. They are intertwined. Clearly, in Africa, we know that 80% of the food production comes from the smallholders. So it's, it's very clear, um, the evidence is there. Our development, if we really want to eat, we need to start from those smallholders. But it does not mean that they should not grow. Grow, which is one of the thematic that we have here. So we also have to encourage the growth of the, uh, of the small uh, holders. And the technology side is also part of the answer because you know, the more you go, um, technology will help a, a two-hectare um, smallholder to also be uh, very um, prosperous. And the global insurance uh, challenge is a main challenge. We have to recognize that. And I think it's only through a partnership that we can come, um, we can come to that. And we also, by showing some example of success, that will also help the private sector to, to, to choose sometimes um, those uh, um, the second type of uh, project that you, you, you mentioned. My, my, my last word maybe is to um, um, echo what um, Roger uh, was, uh, was saying. I think it's crucial to keep in mind that in Africa, more and more, the leaders are very uh, conscious. They are more accountable. They want to leave legacy. And so I am very positive on that. The, the challenge for us is to keep them from a global development perspective, I, I cannot say it enough, it's not just about ag, it's about a rural transformation, a societal transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, on uh, accountability. 
You want to make sure that we are accountable. But democracy in Africa is making dramatic progress. You are accountable because you have elections. You are accountable because you can lose the election. It's not that difficult to lose an election, you know. And uh, uh, public opinion <laughs> is really something new in terms of uh, imposing accountability. Second, you have the social networks. Even if you have not a full democratic process, everybody is informed of your weakness, your weaknesses. So you, are, you are made accountable by in-depth evolution of, of, the, of the society. Second, I think that we, n we have not to optimize the political process. We have to kill many of them. We have not to modernize necessary everything. Because what, a question I have for Prime Minister Tony Blair is, yes, we have to define the priorities, but what are the negative priorities? Where, because you have done that in the UK, where the government has not to interfere, has leave that to the private sector, the foundation. It's very, very important. When I look at, at our country, we are um, creating uh, obstacles to agriculture. The problem is not that we are not efficient enough, not accountable enough, and by building capacity, we could be uh, smarter. It's not the question, Is we are toxic. Now, take an example. It, our um, power generation uh, s s regulatory system is made in 90% of our countries of monopolies. If you want to equip a little farm with renewable energy, solar, biomass, and so on, it has to be an experiment, an exception to the law, because the law is that your national greed, your national operator has a monopoly. And this monopoly will, as far as agriculture is concerned, and you can have that for, for water supply as well, is a real limitation. You have to uh, sort of focus the state on a far less comprehensive list of actions and leave people uh, able to uh, be entrepreneurs. And, and, and we are toxic. We have to dismantle a part. It, it has to be the counterpart of our priorities. We have to dismantle a part of the system. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to try to answer the two questions in one and then have my final say. Um, uh, I think that, yes, smallholder farmers, it's sustainable, but it will lead to sustained po impoverishment. Um, what the, the issue is is that the market is both informal and fragmented. And so the key is, I think, to bring smallholder farmers into structured trade through different schemes, um, aggregation, get them access to finance, give them access to storage. I, you know I promote commodities exchange as a system-wide answer to those problems of smallholder farmers. Um, but it's sustainable, but it's sustained po impoverishment. And I would say the same thing on the question about how do you access smallholder farmers better through structured institutions, through intermediation, through markets that have become more formalized and less fragmented. I don't, for one, believe in outgrower schemes and these things because I don't think it creates the, the transparency, um, which continues to put, and price discovery, which continues to put uh, these smallholder farmers at a disadvantage. Um, and it also just doesn't build a type of uh, regional trade and uh, that will lead to prosperity. And then my final point is I, I've been inspired by Mr. Blair's peas and I'm adding to them. I put politics in there, which you, you had politics already. But I want to put power in your piece um, because I think power matters. And the power that you're talking about in terms of leaders who take accountability and demand um, and, and demand action and performance on the part of their ministers and senior officials is, a, is, is a, a critical part of power. The power that we saw from the AU, which took the decision to create a continental free trade agreement through the vision of certain leaders, 
is, is the real exercise of power. Um, but African countries are poor relatively compared to the global system out there. Some of the countries don't have a GDP bigger than corporations, right? And so there's a power dynamic at the global level that also impacts the capacity of African countries to transform these economies, use agriculture as a driver of economic development and prosperity for its citizenship. And what I'm saying, because I've been on the other side of that power dynamic, being of an official in the U.S. government, when the U.S. government and Western governments and other governments globally come with power and try to set the priorities of the continent. And they do that through power, whether it's financial resources, whether given free or not. Um, when they do that through uh, military uh, capacity, whether it's giving arms or not, or helping with, you know, I'm not saying it's all negative, I'm just saying it is power. And power is neutral, it's just exercise. Um, it, constrains the capacity of African leaders to lead, unless they do it collectively like they did through the African Union, which now there are certain Western governments who are trying to undermine the Continental Free Trade Agreement, right? And so I think that the power dynamic also, the power of leaders to actually set agendas, work collectively, and achieve the transformation of their countries and their continent and their people, as well as the global power dynamic that unless you get that collective action, Africa is always going to be at a disadvantage and is not going to have the ability to truly set its own priorities and its own agenda. Thank you. Mr. Blair. So I'll be very brief in the interest of another P, which is uh, punctuality. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I adopt everything that's been said by uh, the rest of the panel on, on the smallholders. Just on the second question, I think the, the world works today by connectivity and innovation. And the more connected you are, the more you learn, and the more you learn, the more you're able to innovate. And innovation is the key to progress today. And that's why we need to make sure that platforms like this and forums like this are used, not just to discuss, but to link people up, both public sector, private sector, civic society. And if we do that, we're more likely to get out of the P of poverty and into the P of prosperity. Thank you. Not, not only uh, in the interest of time, but also because we've covered so much ground and it would be impossible for me to summarize uh, all of the fantastic points that were made. Let me just ask everybody to help me in thanking this panel for this fantastic conversation. Thank you.